series of English for You. Before presenting helpful instructions on effective writing, let us first ask a question. Why is good writing important? Of course, if you just write to your friends, relatives, or family, your writing does not have to be exact or 100% correct. Although, even among those close to us, we may find some people who get offended by a sloppy writing. Nevertheless, there are situations in life when the way we write must adhere to certain standards so as to achieve our desired goals. In addition, generally, there is a strong relationship between the way we write and the way we communicate. Orally. A classical example can be writing on your school exams. Your writing will be reviewed by professional teachers and constitute part of your grade. Yet there are other situations in life when your writing skills will be absolutely crucial. Let us take, for example, another situation when you will be looking for a job. First, you will need to contact a potential employer by writing a cover letter and attach a CV or resume. Your writing in this case will be a reflection of who you are, how much you know, and ultimately may lead to your being hired or rejected. Your writing skills will be valuable or even necessary on the job too. Depending on the type of work, you may need to write emails to other employees, managers, or customers. You may even need to email other organizations or legal entities. There is a host of other situations where good and effective writing is essential, and they are too numerous to mention in this video. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us get down to business and begin with the sentence structures. We will look at various components of a sentence, their order and examples of how they are used. Hi, my name is Tony Garabas, and I would like to go over this sample writing with you and point out some of the pitfalls that you can avoid in the future. For example, at a first glance we can see that this paragraph is extremely long. Upon a closer look at this paragraph, we can see that it contains sentences that are very long and separated by commas rather than by periods. In this example, we're going to take a look at redundant phrases and repetitions. And here I have made substitutions for these redundancies or summarized the phrases into short, to the point phrases or words. In this example, we're going to take a look at punctuation and how to separate different clauses in a sentence by commas. In many writings, as for example here, the writer is using you. Uh, this you can be changed to a third person, such as a person, he or she, or generally people. Because when we read you, the reader feels like, oh, the person is talking directly to me. 
But in reality, the writer is talking about a third person. Another typical pitfall is the beginning of a sentence or a paragraph. Typically, a student starts writing a sentence, so, or besides. However, we can use connectors such as in addition, moreover, therefore, and many more. Here we have an example of a student using word things. In a formal writing, I would suggest use words such as items, points, anything or some things, not just plain things. In many cases, it is evident that the writer thinks in native language and then writes it in English. So let's take a look at a general basic structure of a sentence. I call it the, the skeleton of a sentence. First, the subject, verb, object, caution now because uh, sometimes we can have a sentence without an object, place, and time. Generally, a paragraph should have the structure as follows. Each paragraph should have a topic sentence supported by two or three supporting sentences. So much for the structure of the paragraph. Before deciding to write on any kind of a topic, it is important to think about who you are writing to, not just your fellow students or your teacher, but in general, it could be people in other countries, and research some articles on a given topic that you are planning to write about, so you become familiar with the new words and phrases that you can use in your writing. Because many words in English have different meanings depending on the context, you can check how that word is used in different contexts by putting it in Google or even a whole phrase of words. You can put them between two double quotes and see in what context those phrases or words appear in Google, in different articles. For example, the phrase, make my homework. Okay, we can double check it in Google, put it in double quotes, and see what kind of hits or responses we get. We change the word make to do. I do my homework. And let's take a look at the results in Google. These were just a few examples of helpful hints that I wanted to share with you. And I hope to see you in our next video. A simple sentence, also called an independent clause, has the following structure. Subject, verb, object, place, and time. For example, the student reads books in the library after school. The subject is the student, reads is the verb, books is the object, in the library is the place, and after school is time. We can, however, put 
the time after school at the beginning of the sentence. So after school, the student reads books in the library. This is the basic skeleton of an English sentence. We can, however, add pronouns or adjectives before nouns. In English, adjectives generally precede nouns and adverbs that are typically placed before verbs. Also, object, place, and time may be optional in some cases. Here we have a more colorful example of this sentence using adjectives and adverbs. Our student often reads English books at or in the university library after school. Our is a possessive adjective. Student is a noun, in this case, the subject. Often, an adverb reads a verb. English, an adjective. Books is another noun, in this case, the object. At or in the university library is the place and after school is time. Notice that in English we can place one noun before another noun. In this case, university is a noun and library is a noun. If, however, we place university before library, then university serves as an adjective. Now, let's take a look at a compound sentence. A compound sentence contains two independent clauses joined by a coordinator. The most common coordinators are such as follow for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. Except for very short sentences, coordinators are always preceded by a comma. In the following compound sentences, subjects are in yellow, verbs are in green, and the coordinators and the commas that precede them are in red. Number one, I try to speak Spanish and my friend try to speak English. Number two, Alejandro played football so Maria went shopping. Number three, Alejandro played football, for Maria went shopping. In this last sentence, the word for is a synonym of because. Next, let's take a look at complex sentences. A complex sentence has an independent clause joined by one or more dependent clauses. A complex sentence always has a subordinator such as because, since, after, although, or when, and of course many others, or a relative pronoun such as that, who, or which. In the following examples, the independent clauses are in green and the dependent clauses are in yellow. Number one, when he handed in his homework, that's the dependent clause. He forgot to give the teacher the last page. That's the independent clause. Number two, the teacher returned the homework. Independent clause, after she noticed the error. Dependent clause. Number three, the students are studying. Independent clause, because they have a test tomorrow. Dependent clause. Number four, after they finished studying, dependent clause, Juan and Maria went to the movies, independent clause. Number five, Juan and Maria went to the movies, independent clause, after they finished studying, dependent clause. When a complex sentence begins with a subordinator, such as sentences one and four, a comma is required at the end of the dependent clause. When the independent clause begins the sentence with a subordinator in the middle, as in sentences 
2, 3, and 5, no comma is required. If a comma is placed before the subordinators in sentences 2, 3, and 5, it is wrong. Complex sentences and adjective clauses. Finally, sentences containing adjective clauses or dependent clauses are also complex because they contain an independent clause and a dependent clause, in which case the dependent clause is in the middle of an independent clause. In the following examples, the adjective clause, which is also a dependent clause, is in yellow, and the rest of the sentence that is in green is the independent clause. In other words, the adjective clause in these situations is embedded within the independent clause. Number one, the woman who called my mom sells cosmetics. The part who called my mom is the adjective clause. Number two, the book that Jonathan read is on the shelf. That Jonathan read is the adjective clause. Number three, the house which Abraham Lincoln was born in is still standing. Which Abraham Lincoln was born in is the adjective clause. Number four, the town where I grew up is in the United States where I grew up is the adjective clause. We can uh, look at the adjective clause also as additional information to the subject. It also could be an additional information to the object if placed after the object. In these examples, we can see how independent clauses can be joined in one sentence. First sentence, Fernando left. Second sentence, Erica brushed her long black hair. In this case, we can join the two independent clauses into one sentence with a coordinating conjunction and. One and two, Together, Fernando left and Erica brushed her long black hair. Or we can join them together with a semicolon. Fernando left, Erica brushed her long black hair. We must remember that all sentences must have at least one independent clause. Also note, that any of the coordinating conjunctions, such as and, but, for, nor, or, so, and yet, can be used to join an independent clause to another independent clause. But, in formal writing, we should not place them at the beginning of a sentence.